C-peptide range should be somewhere between two, two and a half to four, right? And that range is small, but a point two means that you were producing such low amounts of insulin and still actually thriving with an A1C of 5.6. That's actually pretty impressive and shows the dedication of the lifestyle changes you were making. But that was the incorrect diagnosis. You were misdiagnosed given the wrong information about your body because you didn't have that critical piece of information, which was that C-peptide value. Welcome back to Green Glow. We are so happy to have you here and excited to be here for another phen phenomenal um, episode where we are introducing a new feature for our podcast. And this is what we're going to call Coach's Corner. And it's an opportunity for us to bring our coaches in to talk about the work they're doing, to talk about themselves, to talk about what inspires them about this process and working with Mastering Diabetes. Um, we have a phenomenal team and uh, it's exciting to see the team continue to grow and to see the results that our coaches are getting with their clients. And so here at Coach's Corner, what we're going to do is we're going to bring our coaches in to interview, to talk about their, their own personal journey, to talk about uh, their journey with their clients. And it's a really great way of also continuing that storytelling process that, you know, Lauren and I are really excited about. So today we are joined by coach Linda Rukavina. Uh, we're just so excited to have you here and thank you so much for being here first and foremost. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Yay. Um, and, and I have the pleasure of yeah. reading Linda's bio to let you all know a little more about her. And then she will be able to explain this just a bit more as we go on. So here we are. Linda is a national board certified health and wellness coach and holds a lifestyle medicine coach certificate from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. She also has an MBA in finance and spent many years in corporate finance and consulting. She has been living with diabetes for 30 years, first with gestational diabetes and then misdiagnosed with type 2 diabetes. In 2012, she transitioned to a plant-based diet and began trying to reverse diabetes with diet and exercise. She lost weight and her A1C improved, but remained around 5.6%. In 2020, she had testing that revealed a genetic form of diabetes and low insulin production. To help with the transition to insulin, she did private coaching with Mastering Diabetes. The coaching process was so transformative, it inspired her to pursue health coaching. Now, she has the privilege of helping others master their diabetes. She works with clients with all forms of diabetes, but especially loves working with adults newly diagnosed with type 1 or type 1 and a half and people struggling to get an accurate diagnosis. So we welcome Coach Linda. Woo-hoo! Thank you. <laughs> oh, my God. It is great such a bio. treat to have you here. Yeah, it's a great bio. There's so much to like uncover here in your background for so many different reasons. You know, you you've had this really courageous leap from your finance background to become a coach. You you know, you worked with mastering diabetes. So, you know, tell us how did you? I guess like for me, my first question is like, what? How did you come across mastering diabetes, and like, what was the impact for that on your life? So, I think the biggest impact was a. Um... Was, the first was in 2012, my husband brought home a Joel Furman book. Um, and um, and so it was just, um, you know, eating a plant-based diet and reversing diabetes. And this was all like mind-blowing to someone who'd been living with diabetes for like 20 years, maybe, and thinking that you're supposed to go low carb. And so it was all a brand new thing. And then through, once you like are part of one plant-based world thing, you get invited to these other podcasts or summits or whatever. And I think it was um, John and Ocean Robbins summit, the Food Revolution Network. And um, so I heard Cyrus and Robbie speak and I was like blown away. Um, and you guys uh, at that time, 2017, were offering large group coaching, which I also did, but I didn't make any progress because I didn't know what I didn't know about myself. I went to my doctor and asked for a C-peptide test. And she said, we don't do that anymore. It's out of date. And I was like, oh, okay. And I didn't pursue it further. So big learning, right? You don't just go with just whatever the doctor, the, the person in charge says, you have to fully pursue every aspect of your health to make sure you get 
the right information. So, you know, time went on and, um, but I, as soon as the book came out, I think the very first day that it came out, I got it and read it. I stayed up all night, read the book and was doing everything even way back before I went on insulin and was fully convinced I had type two diabetes. And I was, if I could just lose the weight, I would be able to reverse the diabetes because everything says it's caused by having too much fat and even, you know, 10 pounds can be too much excess fat. And so like I did everything. Uh, I went to the point of even doing, um, I did an 18 day fast at True North. And um, after that, I did another program where they had me eating green smoothies with like two tablespoons of beans and a couple of tablespoons of blueberries and just greens and water. And I got down to 95 pounds on my five foot two frame. And um, at, and then I had this additional testing, which revealed my C-peptide at the time was 0.26. And then it was like, oh, okay. And, you know, through being at True North and stuff, I got, um, so I learned about uh, continuous glucose monitoring, which is also something I had never heard of before. Doctor had never talked about before because I was always hovering in that pre-diabetes range. It's always the, you've got pre-diabetes, just manage it with diet and exercise and you'll be fine. You can reverse this. And so when I finally realized that I couldn't reverse it, uh, but I still didn't really know what I had, um, then I, I went on insulin and um, I worked with Coach Adam Sud, which was amazing, just amazing. The process was just unbelievable because I was looking for tools. So I came into mastering diabetes as a client, fully transitioned to a low fat plant-based diet. I had been tracking my food in chronometer um, for three years. I knew what I was eating. I knew you know all of that stuff, but I didn't know how to manage insulin. And I like to say to my clients that um, insulin dependent diabetes is the only chronic disease in the world where a doctor will hand you drugs that will kill you if not used properly and say, good luck with that. And then you're really kind of off on your own. And so starting out on insulin, you know, having Adam as my coach, learning how to do decision trees, it was just so empowering, you know, to just feel like I could manage this really scary disease in a completely different way. So if, if I compare that to what it felt like when I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes, in 1991 with um, at, when I was pregnant with my first child and I was sent home with two vials of insulin. And I remember just the fear and the grief and the crying that this was my life as a pregnant person, you know? And that experience, which was like terrible, horrible, frightening compared to what it was like to be part of the Mastering Diabetes community and have this awesome coach that I am sending, you know, decision trees to, and getting feedback and getting these little tiny tweaks, you know, that just make life really doable. And so it really, it was very empowering. And it, um, I had been trying to figure out something different other than um, corporate finance to do anyway. And I have been circling around coaching for many years. So I have done um, corporate, you know, business coaching. I have done consulting and assessments and I had done pastoral counseling and all of those have aspects of coaching in them. And I had a large team when I worked in corporate finance. And so then it was like, oh, this really is like the perfect thing for me. Cause I was already, you know, talking to everybody I could about plant-based eating and mastering diabetes. And so um, I took a leap and got trained. And then lo and behold, as soon as I completed my board exam and uh, was notified that I passed, there was an ad to start working for mastering diabetes. So here I am two years later. Yeah. It's oh my amazing. God. What a journey. So huge impact. I mean, the lifestyle mm -hmm. itself has had an impact on your, on your life. Um, one thing, I mean, there's so much that you shared there that I feel like could be expanded on in so many big ways. But one thing you said was, you know, here you were living, you know, you were given this diagnosis of prediabetes based on your A1C alone. That was the only thing that was being used as a metric to say your diagnosis is prediabetes. Done, right? That's the conventional sort of understanding of a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. However, there you were not producing any insulin. A C-peptide of 0.2, just for some context for people who don't know the C-peptide range, a C-peptide of 0.2 is functionally equivalent to zero insulin production. I mean, maybe you were 
pushing out little bits of insulin here and there. But that means that, you know, a healthy, so let's a, a, sort of like non insulin dependent diabetes um, C peptide range should be somewhere between two, two and a half to four, right? And that range is small, but a point two means that you were producing such low amounts of insulin and still actually thriving with an A1C of 5.6. That's actually pretty impressive and shows the dedication of the lifestyle changes you were making. But that was the incorrect diagnosis. You were misdiagnosed given the wrong information about your body because you didn't have that critical piece of information, which was that C-peptide value. Mm -hmm. And right. yeah, we see that. I mean, this is a very common experience for a lot of people that we work with. And so I'm really, really, really glad to hear you bring that up and like share this with people because I know that there are people out there listening who are probably thinking, well, this sounds similar to my story. You know, this sounds similar to what I experience with my A1C results or my my habits, my my lifestyle choices. Yeah, and so then you get to the point. And so I see people like this all the time now. People that are underweight, they are like ten to twenty pounds underweight. They're obsessively exercising after meals to try to get their blood sugar to come back into range, and they're hardly eating anything. So they're they're not eating any fruit. They're just eating greens and salads. They're essentially starving to death. They're, they're malnourished and they they don't know really what's wrong with them. And maybe they haven't had a C-peptide test and they haven't had the antib antibody test. So the other thing is I had the antibody testing and that was all negative. And so um, that's a, another further picture because then the doctor really has no idea what you have. And finally, I saw a, an endocrinologist who um, did like a very quick you know, when did this start? You know, you're at around age 30, you were not overweight um, and it have a strong family history. Well, those three things are the indicators that I probably had MODI, which is maturity onset diabetes of the young, which requires um, at the time a very expensive genetic test, which my insurance did not want to do. And the, um, the testing companies though paid for it for me. Um, and then it revealed that I had this very rare type of diabetes, which takes that whole shame thing. So that's part of this whole, um, I think that's one of the biggest barriers to getting healthy and reversing diabetes is that the first thing that you get is a diagnosis that you caused this and it's your fault. And if you would only just lose some weight, you know, everything is going to go well, which is never the way to start a lifestyle change, you know. This is so, I, I think this is, has so much passion to it because the, the stretch of diabetes, the, the overarching theme of diabetes is there is a lot of shame to it. And what you're describing here is that it can be such a devastating thing to be working so hard that you actually work yourself into deficiency, nutritional deficiency, because you're trying to proactively attack this thing that you've been diagnosed with when lo and behold, you haven't even come close to what's really going on in your body just because healthcare practitioners aren't seeing the whole picture. They're making a quick decision and selling you short. And look at what it takes sometimes to get to the point of becoming the master of your own body. And what I hear you doing, Linda, that I love is you took the knowledge and you were passionate about it. It became a passion because look at what you went through to get to this point. And that's what it why diabetes is so unique. That's why our lives with diabetes are so unique because for so many of us, we went through some profound lifestyle change, like this kind of awakening to get to where we are in order to share that knowledge forward. Then you get into coaching and then you get into some, some really interesting things, I suppose, particularly when it comes to emotional health. So where did you go with that? Mm-hmm. Well, there, um, there's certainly this huge grief component of being diagnosed with a chronic disease, you know, and so there is this acceptance that you have to get to. And when you can get to the point where you have come sort of through the other side where you have some answers and you have um, taken, uh, you've taken steps to make yourself healthy and you're feeling better and, um, you know, you're your labs are better and you've become, you know, very um, fit and gotten to your more of an ideal body weight, then you start feeling like this whole thing was actually a benefit to me. 
And so how can you just twirl that around and turn it into a benefit? But the first thing that has to happen is that you accept it as this is my life and I have to deal with it and I have something serious. And um, the thing that's unique about diabetes is it's invisible until it isn't, until the point where you start, you know, maybe you, it gets super severe and you start having um, neuropathy or your eye, you have eye bleeds or whatever. And we do have clients that have those really serious symptoms or you start having, um, you know, um, cardio symptoms or other things. It can go on for years and years and be invisible. And so by getting to the point of just accepting this is what I've got to deal with without shame, and I'm just moving forward, and going from today on, like we all come at this very honestly, we come through our food culture and, you know, none of us are taught to help to eat in a healthy way. Um, even if you weren't told you had diabetes, you still aren't taught to eat in a healthy way. The food that's around us, the food that other people are eating isn't healthy. So we all come at this just in a very, you know, there's no shame in it. And we, and a lot of people are coming at it with, um, they become unhealthy because of some other things in their life, you know, like other people are sick in their life and they aren't taking care of themselves. And because of that, they end up with diabetes or some other kind of a diagnosis and um, just kind of accepting that as this is what it is and, you know, grieving over it, but then just stepping forward from there rather than shaming yourself into doing nothing, which I think is an easy thing for us to do. Especially when, um, for a lot of people, the comfort that they've, they've come accustomed to is food. You know, when we're, when we're, when we're comforting those emotions, those, those difficult times, or, you know, I, I myself, like sometimes I can remember a time where I would say, oh, well, I had a really rough day. I'm going to eat X, Y, Z, you know, and a lot of it, like I used to be obsessed with Twizzlers, <laughs> like, um, you know, true, honest truth here. Right. Um, and I would, I remember I would just like, mindlessly chew on them as like a cope, you know, like for like a coping thing, right? I don't know. It was like a hard day or a stressful day. And it was like a, something to work through. I don't even know what it was, but I was just like obsessed with them. And that so I'm sure anybody listening can think of a time where they've turned to food to help you feel better. And Unfortunately, if the foods that you're turning to are the foods that are going to promote more disease or are going to contribute to more insulin resistance, that is obviously not an ideal choice. And that's something that we also help people through, through this process of lifestyle change. And it sounds like, you know, maybe you've even experienced that where you've turned to other things that um, are going to continue to promote your health and wellness, um, you know, through your journey. Well, I thought of something as you were talking. When you said Twizzlers, I thought for sure I was ready to ask Linda to tell us about ice cream. Linda, tell us about the ice cream. Okay. Well, um, one of the things that um, was a barrier for me, I mean, and this is like for all of us, we have barriers in this whole lifestyle change. And so like I made lots of changes, but I still let myself have pizza and ice cream which of course then becomes like you can constantly have pizza and ice cream and never gain insulin sensitivity and never really make a lot of progress or lose weight when you have these foods that you're eating several times a week. And so uh, eventually, and I think it was Coach Adam that got me started with this because I had so much weight to regain. And so I started eating these smoothie bowls, which were frozen bananas, frozen mangoes, and um, power greens or spinach or something. And so now like that is the go-to food. And I, I can't even tell you how many of my clients like that is their favorite food too. And I, you know, lots of us are having, like I had ice cream for breakfast today. So it was blueberry cherry with cocoa powder and power greens in it and bananas. And it was amazing. You know, you know, it's 90 grams of carbs, 400 some calories, and it will keep me going this morning. So that totally has cut off that need for any form of ice cream. And I am very prone to return home from a trip. And the first thing that I will do is make my smoothie bowl because I know it, I think it's all the nutrition that I've been missing from when I've been out and away from home. And I get all those greens in there. I mean, that thing is bright green, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. And well, the smoothie bowl and substitution for ice cream is a phenomenal 
re replacement. And just to kind of circle back because you, and just again, for some perspective for people who are under producing insulin, weight loss is a common experience. And it's an, un sometimes it's an unexpected, like you did have weight loss goals at one point, but it became to a point where you lost excess weight and it was too much of a weight loss, right? Like, so for your, what, how, what was your height again? Five, two? Five foot two. Yeah. Five foot two. So an ideal weight for you is around a, probably around 110, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. there you were at that point, 15 pounds underweight. And again, this is a very common experience. A lot of people ask, well, what do I do if I'm underweight? You know, you're talking about uh, uh, this low fat plant-based whole food diet was really great for weight loss, which it is. But then you've got people who are either underproducing insulin or have found themselves to be underweight for whatever reason. And to know that it's possible to regain weight in a very nutritional, nutritionally beneficial way with mm -hmm. smoothie bowls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, smoothie bowls. <laughs> it's, yes. Smoothie bowls. I ha that's, those are my favorite clients to work with. I have a client that came back to me who was one of my original small group clients two years ago, did great. Um, very tall guy and needs a lot of calories a day and did fine and then got talked into by his his uh, endocrinologist to go back to a high fat, low carb diet and started losing all this weight. And so he's back in our small group now and he is eating, you know, 600 grams of carbs a day, 3000 calories a day and the weight is finally coming back on. You know, I've had clients that are eating 4000 calories a day. They might make lent lentil pasta with a lentil sauce in it and they're eating four times a day and they are using like the smallest amount of insulin like one unit of basil these are like the new type 1.5s that have gotten into this really hard place and they're taking tiny amounts of insulin their insulin sensitivity just becomes amazing and they're just eating very large amounts of um, really high quality uh, low fat food it's amazing. And, and you're supporting them in, in regaining nu nu their nutritional density in their body as well. I mean, it's just the food that we're talking about is so rich in nutrients. So, um, yeah. And it's nice to know that you have that experience too. Like, and again, I, I sort of, I love that you have the perspective of being coached and then becoming a coach and, and that relationship with, you know, the coach client relationship is so important. And, um, obviously it's, it's valuable for people because, you know, you have a client who came back to you to work with you again, because they, he, you know, recognized that you would be the person that could help him regain the weight that he was looking to regain. Um, so that's amazing. And I love hearing those stories. I mean, these are some really, um, you know, again, like as coaches, we do this work to help people find some success and find progress in their journey. Um, what types of, um, you know, what, maybe could you talk a little bit more about the, the transition moving from like being coached, right. And then what made, made you, you know, what drove you into the coaching world and like, what is that relationship like too, to be be a coach to somebody? What does that feel like? Well, for me, it felt very natural because I've done so many other things that are so similar. Um, and I don't, I'm not a teaching coach. I am, um, you know, a true health coach where I'm asking questions and people are coaching themselves. And so I'm providing information and uh, letting people adapt it for, to the way that they want. And it's, uh, it's very fun because as you are coached, you are, you know, getting suggestions and your learning skills, and then you start coaching yourself and you see the tables turn. And so that is, that's the way that I coach. I like to ask, you know, provide information and ask people what they want to do with it. And then um, ask, how did it go? What went well? What didn't go well? And they start then telling me what they need to do differently the next time. And so it becomes, uh, it's really an interesting process. The other thing that's unique about coaching is that, um, and I, and this is what Adam did for me. He held hope for me when I maybe didn't have hope. Like I was feeling rather hopeless when I came in at 95 pounds and the confidence that he had that he could carry for me and the hope that he had that, you know, I was going to manage this. It was going to be um, it's very doable. It's not going to be difficult. It's going to take time. But that that confidence and hope, that's what is the most important thing, because people come to us and they're feeling really beat up by the medical profession. Um, they they just feel at a really low point. And a lot of people have no energy because they've e either 
um, not eating anything because you know they are you know they're underweight or they're still malnourished or they are eating this low carb high fat diet and they have they just are getting no carbohydrate energy and so they just feel miserable and so we have energy and confidence and hope and they start to get that from us and we can hold on to that for them until they have it for themselves and so i love asking instead about always just what's your blood sugar and what's your weight i ask how are you feeling you know i like to talk about what's going on in your body how are your emotions changing how is um, your mindset changing as as we go along and how much energy are you feeling and it becomes very empowering for people, for them to realize that they feel better than they have in years. And they have just made some changes to what they're doing, what they're putting in their body. And um, for people that are, you know, in their 50s and 60s or older, that the aches and pains that have been bothering them are no longer bothering them. I have a client right now whose hip was so bad, he could not walk around the block and he's now up to two miles. And um, his his diabetes is reversing. He just finished cancer treatment. He's just doing amazing. And it's just these small tweaks that, you know, over time, you've got time on your side and then you've got the consistency of green light eating. And um, those things, they just, um, it's like a, um, a stone that's rolling downhill and you just pick up more and more and more momentum. And so it just becomes a super empowering um relationship. So like yesterday, I have a, a client who came to me, she was um, obese, and she has lost in six months, um, almost 70 pounds. And she is on insulin, and her insulin use has dropped by a half to two thirds, I believe. And she is doing it all herself. Her time and range, she's wearing a continuous glucose monitor, is always in the, uh, the 95 to 97%. She's managing all of it. Her doctor has said, I trust you to make your own changes now to your insulin. You know, they're watching what she's doing and she's connecting, you know, with her healthcare provider. So that relationship is well established. And it's just amazing. And she talks now through the whole half an hour that we're together every week. And at the end of it, all I have to say is, what are you going to focus on this week? And she has already talked herself and processed all the way through everything that went well. This is the stress of the week. This is what I would have done a year ago. And this is what I did this year when I had these stresses come up. And all of that is very motivating and reinforcing for what she's doing. And she makes adjustments. This is what worked. This is what didn't. I love her hack for how she got through... Um, her week of doing uh, report cards and you were talking about eating Twizzlers. So she bought Brussels sprouts and she made these roasted Brussels sprouts that have um, a coating of hummus on them, no oil hummus. That And um, she just ate Brussels sprouts when she was doing report cards and she got through, you know, perfectly intact. In a, in, a, in a prior year, she would have gained weight, weight and done a lot of eating out during uh, report card week. And now she's noticing herself feeling great, sleeping great, got through it without gaining weight. Like, amazing. I love this theme of like, right, like this theme of building health that's coming through, this building. Because what you did, Linda, like for your, your own, own physical ability is building back your body building back your body, but also it was building back your mindset, as you had mentioned, building back your relationship with yourself, your relationship with food. There's so much of this coming back to life that happens in a process like this. I think for, for any of us with diabetes or for any of us that, that are watching with somebody that we love maybe battling through a chronic condition is like this, this idea that it, it takes more than that doctor's visit, as you had started off with, you go to the doctor's visit, the information that you get, it may not be the whole story. So continue to pursue something to build back your health in a place where you want it. And what happens in a coaching program is it's not just eat this, exercise that, because there's so much more to what that building up looks like. And it's the type of questions that you're asking to the point where you are working with a client and they say, here are my bar barriers. Here's what I'm working with now. And they're able to make the call. They call it out. And it takes 
look at where, where you started 2012. I mean, this is, it's just not an overnight process. That's why in coaching, if you meet weekly with a group or with one-on-one, look at the accountability and the check-in and the empowerment that can happen in that relationship. I always say that if you feel the same way, like about coaching, how it's just such an intimate experience when you're with someone like that. And I feel a little bit just like I'm like I'm picking up coaching from Linda, like right now, like just for myself, if, if it's like, it's apparent, you know, you hear things and then you kind of mentally do these check-in points, relationship with food, how I'm using my insulin, how I'm exercising relationship with self, all of that really comes through in your story and in your client stories also. Thank you. Yeah. And you know, the other place that's super powerful is in our small group coaching uh, because people share every day. They, they share uh, um, in my insulin dependent groups, they put their, um, their, like their Dexcom or Libre CGM, a 24 hour graphs out there. And they say, this is what I did. This is what I ate. Some people are posting their chronometer food logs and they're saying, oh, I had a problem with this and I'm struggling at this time of day or during this situation. And then the other group members are in there before I could even respond. And they're going, you got this, you can do this great job. And people are sharing, you know, their A1C. They're also saying, I am not doing well with this area. And they're getting really great ideas from other people in the group. And so it is this wonderful, very warm um, environment of accountability and support. And again, no shame. We're all here. We're all doing this together. And so you just don't feel alone anymore, you know? And I think that is the, that's the thing that happened when I joined Mastering Diabetes as a coach. And I had all, always disliked group things. I'm a, I'm, I'm a very much of a one-on-one thing person. And I didn't know if I was going to like small group coaching. And then I got onto the Mastering Diabetes team, which is in itself a small group. And we are all living, you know, kind of this life together. And some of us have diabetes and some of us don't. And I realized I had never talked to anybody about my insulin use before. And how lonely is that other than my coach when I had, you know, a couple of years earlier. And so like, it is, it's so empowering to be part of a community where you're sharing, you know, this is, this is what's going well. This is what's not going well for the, the non-insulin dependent people too. Tons of recipes that people are sharing and the things that, you know, that, that make this life doable and simple for people. So it is super powerful to be part of a community. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even just like you were describing, like the cheerleading and the support that comes through with that. And, you know, when we started group coaching, there was one format and it was like that large group style that you were referring to at the very beginning. And over time, we learned that the small group coaching was so important for people to have community because there's a lot of people out there who don't have someone to talk about it with. And that exactly, you nailed it, like with the loneliness and not you know, feeling like not only alone, but then like, then those thoughts start to creep in. Like, well, I'm alone. I don't have anybody to talk to about this. I must be thinking about this wrong. Nobody else wants to do plant, you know, nobody else wants to eat plant-based food. So I must be wrong about that. Or, you know, no one else in my life is going to support my lifestyle changes. So I'm just not going to do it. Right. Because it's too hard. And what group coaching and small group coaching is what we now are offering. What small group coaching offers is a place. It's a space for you to go and talk about the things that are, that you're winning in, that you're challenged by the things that are, that are real in your blood, watching your blood glucose changes or the variability. These are real things that when you're living with specifically diabetes and you're watching these types of things, you're watching your numbers, you're talking about your insulin, you now have a place to go and talk about it with people who actually understand. And it is so powerful. And, you know, I agree. I think that, you know, I remember when we talked about the coaching position, like, you know, those years ago and, um, you know, as we were getting you ready to, to join the team, um, you know, your, your passion for wanting to really share your experience really came through to me because it was a really unique journey and you were, you knew you could help people through this. Like you knew it. You're like, I know I can help people 
who have been in my situation because I know how hard it is. I know how challenging it can be. And like, I want to be that person. I'm, you wanted to be that hope holder, you know? And, um, and that was really inspiring to me and made me want you to join the team even more, you know? Um, and as the coaching team has, has grown, you know, the ability to talk about these things as a team has been really, to your point, really, really powerful. And, and that's why, you know, in our coaching program, you're really never coached by your one coach. Like there's a whole team of coaches. We have 16 people behind the scenes that if, you know, if there's something that you need help with, like someone on our team has that answer, you know? So, and that's the really, another really cool element of our coaching program that we're very close and connected and accessible to one another. So, you know, Linda, you're living with insulin, you know, with an insulin dependent diabetes, Lauren, you are as well. Some of our other coaches don't, but they've had other experiences. Maybe they've reversed type two diabetes or they've had other experiences. So there's so much interconnectedness with our team to help our clients get the optimal answers to their questions or to where they are in their process. And that's something that's really exciting too. It is really exciting. You know, as you were talking, the other thing that um, I'm hearing a lot of people talk about right now is um, they are getting off, of, they want to get off of Ozempic or Wagovi or Manjaro or these um, GLP-1 agonist drugs. And it is so hard. And so um, I have a non-insulin dependent group and these very brave people, they go off of it, they watch their numbers go up for a while, they watch the weight come back on for a while. And then we start, you know, we're cheering them on and, and it starts to reverse and it, uh, and um, things start settling down. It is really a battle because these drugs now are so prevalent and they are, you know, they have such a strong impact and yet people, they don't feel well, they want to get off them. They want to learn how to um, manage their relationship with food that is full of fiber and full of water that keeps them full, that does a lot of the same function as these drugs. And so this is a, another one of those safe spaces for people to do that in a really healthy way um, and not get discouraged by what they're seeing in the short run for the long-term, you know, better health. I'm so happy to hear you say that. I mean, that definitely gets into a, an area where I think a number of us are really passionate when we hear someone um, tell us their goals. And sometimes we'll ask, do you have any goals to change your medications, to reduce them, to take less, particularly if we're talking about prediabetes or type 2 diabetes that might have an aggressive uh, list of pharmaceuticals that are glucose lowering. And they say, gosh, well, yeah, of course I want to decrease my medications, but I didn't think I could. And I think that's an amazing thing that when we start to hear these stories, what we can help people do in coaching is help them ask the right questions. And one of the greatest questions someone can go to their doctor with is, hey, doc, tell me about deprescribing. What does that mean? Tell me how these medications interact because I'm really taking my lifestyle into my own hands and I've got a coach and I've got resources and I am going for it. So I need you to teach me what these medications are doing and what if in six weeks we decide that I can take less. And I love that more than anything. Um, the, the, the power that, that a person who's just been treated like a patient their whole lives have is now the person with diabetes in the room commanding their health as their primary, the primary decision maker. And we see people doing it. I think it's just awesome. I think that's probably my favorite thing is like taking, taking hold. Yes, for sure. And people just decide this is what I'm going to do. You know, and just telling the doctor, this is what I'd like to do. I'd like you to help me with this. It's really, it's very inspiring to watch it happen. Yeah. I, I mean, resounding. Yes. This is like over the years of working with people, like that's been one of the, you know, most exciting parts about being a coach is seeing that level of empowerment and the, and it's such a power, it's such an important word when it comes to health too, because again, going back to what you were initially saying in your first, you know, the first part of this conversation where you were just accepting of what information you were being given when they were wrong, you know, and, and, and again, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay. You know, we all, but when you're talking about someone's health, like we want to get right answers. We want to make sure we have the right answers. And as consumers of healthcare, which as patients, that's what we are. We're consumers of healthcare. We deserve and are, have the right to the correct information at the correct time. And that's where, again, with co like 
our team, we've got a lot of really, 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 really great members of our team who can help you choose the the proper person to work with, you know, the right doctor to work with. Um, we can help you ask the questions that need to be answered. And when you go in with an, with, with that idea in mind of like, okay, I have questions that I need answered. If you're, if you're working with a physician who either doesn't want to help you, doesn't want to have those conversations, then you know, as a consumer of healthcare, that you need to find a different provider. You know, and that sometimes is a much clearer answer when you go in with your own questions and you become, it becomes very clear, well, this person's not going to help me. So where can I find somebody who will, right? And that is a really important, oh, sorry. That's a really important part of this process also, you know, so you have, so you've touched on so many, so many really amazing parts of this whole process and your journey, which is incredible. Yeah. It, and I think. Um, the whole idea of being curious is important. And I don't think I was curious enough, you know, um, maybe when I was younger and maybe I was more focused on my children and their health and, you know, what was good for them. Um, but as I've gotten older, I've become more and more curious. I've read more and more, educated myself. And it, that really helps um, people as they're in this coaching journey too, as they start feeding themselves differently and just noticing, you know, what is, you know, how does that work for me when I make this change? What has happened for me? And so like building on that curiosity and expecting your doctor then to also be curious. And so I think that's the piece that was missing for me is some of the curiosity from what's going on here. And so I have to be responsible for my own level of that curiosity in my own life. And that's, that's a really fun thing to play with then as you're living with like type one or, or you know, insulin dependent diabetes, you're, it's, you're always in a level of experimentation, trying new things to see what's going to work. Like it, you never get a holiday from it. Right. And so like, that's a whole nother fun thing. And like, instead of thinking it as drudgery, like, uh, taking on every new day in a curious way, like, is this food that I that I don't normally eat going to work for me? Um, how can I make it work for me? How is this exercise going to work for me? How can I make sure that I'm, um, you know, at, exercising at a time that's better for me? Or how do I, should I do intermittent fasting and like trying all these different things? You know, like that, like that can make the whole process of coaching really fun if you go at it in terms of a really curious um, instead of like a perfectionistic lens, just be curious and experiment and work on improving rather than perfecting, I guess. You're making it very clear that we are doing it too. Like we are with so many of oh, these right. clients, you right. know, that, that we kind of learn from each other really. And at, even like as coaches, like so many of us that live the lifestyle or, in, you know, in Kylie's position, she's, she's witnessing her partner perform the duties of having insulin dependent diabetes and it's intense. And that's where, I mean, the, the topic with, with Adam, this holding space this holding that thing that you need more of and the layers of coaching there. There's just so many layers to that. But as coaches, we are with you. We feel the pain. <laughs> we feel that pain. We feel the waking up the next day and having to go through this and having a text message where we know that we need to help motivate somebody. And that in turn can actually kind of motivate us to keep, keep doing our thing too. It's, um, it's, it's support in both ways. It's so true. You know, it's funny when you were just talking, one of the things I thought of was like so many times I've said something or, or reflected something back to a client, you know, that I'm hearing them say, and whatever comes out of my mouth, I'm like, oh my gosh, I really needed to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> like that was for me too, right? So like that mirroring uh, in the relationship of, okay, I'm here to to help help you and guide you and, and be that placeholder for you. But like, guess what? Like I really needed that too. So thank you. <laughs> How many people are listening are thinking about the gallon of briars in the freezer and now they're like, mm, wait a minute, Linda's smoothie bowl is sounding pretty good right now. Maybe my decision making will start to shift a little bit <laughs> from the dairy to the fruit and let's see how I feel in a smoothie bowl. Like, cause I want to, I want to feel like Linda. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, is, is there any, you know, well, I know that there's one example that you give with a lot of your clients and you've shared this with the coaching team as well. Um, can you share with us, you know, especially around insulin dosing, you know, one of the things that you're working with a lot of people who are, 
who are newly who are living with a new onset or, or newly diagnosed with some form of insulin dependent diabetes or are new to using insulin. And because that's something that you're very familiar with and comfortable with, that's a, a population of the client base that you're working with. Um, but there's also a lot of people out there listening to this might also be thinking, you know, like, I, I don't want to use insulin. Like insulin is not something I really feel comfortable with. It's not something I want to use. But then again, it looks like that may be where I'm headed, but I'm scared. I don't like it. You know, what would you tell somebody in that situation? What would you say to them if they're fearing insulin? They're, they're feeling like this isn't something that I want to have to use. Yeah. And this came, I was doing a consult with one of our other coaches' clients. Um, and sometimes we do that. We step in just to talk to an, another, um, just to get a, a, another perspective. And so this woman was crying and telling me she did not want to use insulin. She, her um, blood sugar was very, very high and clearly needed it, had been given a prescription for it, didn't want to take insulin. And yet she's sitting there wearing a pair of glasses. And I said, was it hard for you to get your glasses? And she said, no. And I said, well, this is exactly the same as insulin. You went to the eye doctor and they told you you couldn't see well. And, um, you know, you didn't say to the eye doctor, you know, I'll just take the reading glasses. I really don't want to wear glasses, you know, so just correct me a little bit or just, you know, halfway or not at all. I'm just going to pretend I don't need glasses. Like we don't do that. We also don't do that. Like um, we have so many people that are on thyroid medications and we don't um, we don't tell the doctor, well, just give me a smaller dose than what I really need. And so I just talk about like, this is like putting on a pair of glasses. If you need insulin, you need insulin. Like our, you know, if we have a low C peptide, we do not have um, a deficiency of some drug. We actually are deficient in our ability to make insulin. And sure, we can work on insulin sensitivity, but ultimately, if we don't make enough insulin, we don't make enough insulin. And it's, we're just we're just replacing that which we don't have. It's just like putting on glasses. I'm wearing contacts today. And so I have so many clients that are like, well, I'm, I'm only going to take half as much because I don't want any. And I'm like, well, that really doesn't make sense. I mean, you wouldn't be able to drive if you put on half of your glasses, you know? So yeah, I use that with the clients. They're like, oh, I guess that makes sense. Aha moment right there. I mean, when you shared that with the coaching team, because again, these are the things that we talk about as a team, like ways of connecting the dots for people, ways of making those aha moments come through. And it's so true. Like you wouldn't walk around with like a glasses with like on like your left eye, but not your right. And, and again, I, I'm really glad you pointed out like for people who are not producing enough insulin, that is what we're talking about. Like if you're, if you've been diagnosed with low C peptide and low insulin production, insulin is a hormone that our bodies require. It is necessary for life and hormone it's it's becomes a hormone replacement and you know unfortunately as an injectable that i think re raises concerns for people because it's an injected um you know replacement hormones an injected hormone but um I think it's a really great analogy and i'm really i appreciate you sharing it i wanted you to be able to share that because that's that's the kind of insights that we get the opportunity to help people sort of make connections with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes we just have to change our thinking about things. It's sort of like the fear of eating carbs. Like I have people coming to me that are literally eating 50 grams of carbs a day or less, and they are terrified of eating a banana and like, and they're crying about not being able to eat carbs. And it's just, and they are, they have no energy. They can barely drag themselves out of bed. They can't work. They can't think. You know, they're just feeling miserable. And within a few weeks of just changing their mindset and just giving it a try, uh, you know, and easing your way into it, like they feel better than they have in absolutely years. And they cannot believe that they believed basically a lie, you know, because the insulin is uh, um, or the, the 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 glucose that we're getting from the carbs, like we need that. We need, we need that energy, right? And so like we have to change our mind about certain things. And um, yeah, it's great to do it in a nice supportive environment. I want everybody to hear that piece right there because the fear behind it is what you really called out and um, bringing somebody back to life through that fear. Look at what standardized diabetes nutrition management sounds like. It sounds like restriction 
of the nutrient that we need the most. And it takes a lot of what I think of as nutrition as therapy. It's conversations from people who really see you and have heard that themselves to coach back. It is, it's such a many, many deep layers of carb phobia and where it comes from. And it's so unfortunate that, um, this is, uh, not being talked about far and wide at this point that we've had so many years of carb restriction as the primary nutrition recommendation in diabetes. It's astonishing. It really is. It is amazing. And I think about how I used to feel when I was in my 40s, and I was a lot younger than I am now that I'm in my early 60s. And I was always tired. And I would want to go lay down and take a nap. And after, you know, I just I was constantly tired and sleeping and not doing much. And now like I am up and I am ready. And I have this overall feeling of wellness that like oozes out of me. And it, it's very hard to explain. And I'll be I'll be a little bit tired late in the day. And I'll go I'm going to go take a nap and I will lay down for like 15 minutes and then I'm back up and my husband will say, I thought you were going to take a nap. I'm like, I can't nap anymore. I literally cannot take a long nap because there is so much energy now. And of course, part of that is having insulin. So I actually am getting the glucose into my cells, which is awesome. But the other thing is just eating the healthy food with lots of vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients in it. And just that um, feeling of wellness, which when you then feel well, then you can move your body more, which then makes you feel more well. And it just becomes this really powerful force in your life, you know? Just like Lauren said before, the building. Yeah. And the building, right? It's, it's not about just taking one way of living here and just all of a sudden just doing one way of living here. It's starting at a place and building, 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 adding those building blocks I, I think that's a great, like, that's such a great uh, mental image of what you're, what we're doing, what we're trying to help people with is like creating that tool belt, uh, you know, using this and, and building that, that new lifestyle, right? Whatever that looks like for you. It's very yeah, exciting. Absolutely. I like the idea of the tool belt because we do have some tools. <sighs> we do. Right. We do. You know, absolutely. like you start with green light eating and you work on that for a while. And then a lot of clients go to um, tracking food, which is a great tool in the tool belt. And um, then a lot of insulin dependent clients need to use the, you know, the decision tree to really understand how much insulin they need to be taking the balance between long acting and short acting and everything. And, um, and then you, have, you start adding in exercise and intermittent fasting. And then I like to also, add, you know, talk about sleep and, um, you know, your social life you know, and your even your work life, like what are you doing with your life? Like, are you living by your values? Like there, there are so many layers to um, our idea of wellness. And uh, we can touch on, you know, all of those things. It might start with food and, and a diagnosis of diabetes or prediabetes, but it really works into all aspects of your life. No doubt. Absolutely. And um, well, and uh, what we like, we like to like refer to that tool belt as like the green light tool belt. And, you know, after a certain period of time working with a coach, what we hope that you gain is that, you know, you'll have these tools that you'll know when to use them. You know, it's like, if you were to start, if you were to actually like for me, for example, like I don't know how to build a house, but if you show me how to use a hammer and I use the hammer enough times, I might figure out how to put two boards together. And then, you know, you teach me how to use another piece of equipment. I can learn it. But in until you learn how to use those tools, you're really probably not going to be able to build a very safe house at the beginning, right? So that's where the coach comes in to teach you how to use the tools. And it's about one of the best takeaways for me is about using the right tool at the right time. And, you know, we have this collection of green light tools that we're teaching our clients how to use and when to use them for their optimal insulin sensitivity. And so, you know, I do want to ask you though, like, do you have any favorite green light tools? Like what are, what are the green light tools that are like, you can't get through your day without? Yeah. Yeah. I lost you there for a second. I think you asked about like, what, what are the, the tools that I can't really get through the day without? Um, That's right. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Well, um, I like to keep my life very simple. Okay. So I think like that for me, I, um, I do not have a strong need for novelty and I have learned that I don't need to make dozens of meals per week and make them all pretty and take photos of them and share them on Instagram or anything. I just need to make my life work very simply. So my non-negotiable type of, you know, like green light activities is are to have like one or two meals 
ready. And I, when I mean meals, I'm like very large pots of soup or stew. That's like a very typical thing for me to have every day. And lately I've been eating an entire bag of kale every day. I put it in the Instant Pot on zero minutes low pressure and um, steam it very lightly. And I eat it with balsamic vinegar at a couple of meals. Delicious. Love that. Because I live in Minnesota and it's kind of too cold to be eating salad constantly. And so I'm still getting tons of green vegetables. And then I keep my um, my other meals super, super simple, like um, berries and arugula with vinegar on it will be one. And then my smoothie bowls of varying, you know, different kinds of fruits and things are another. So those are like my, my go-to way of eating. And um, in terms of like movement, I, I try to get to Pilates you know, four times a week at least. And then I try to do cardio on the other days. Um, I have a uh, jump sport trampoline in my basement that I like to stream classes on, which is super fun. And I have this new gizmo that's called Cross Rope. And it is a, um, it's a Bluetooth um, ropeless jump rope set that can count your reps and use stream classes. And it is very, very cool and motivating and super fun, like um, high interv- um hit kind of classes. And so like having those sorts of things and the, like one tip that I have, I learned from starting to take Pilates classes very early in the morning is that if I just get up and put my exercise clothes on and act like I am the kind of person that exercises every morning and am a very active person, I will actually exercise, right? And so laying my clothes out the night before, putting it in the bathroom, getting up in the morning, putting it on, just getting it over with during uh, right away in the morning. Like that is the only way for me to do it. So there you go. Those are my tips. Amazing. I lo- I, it comes to mind of like, you know, like fake it till you make it, <laughs> right? Like just do it. Be the person that you want, like put on yeah. the clothes of the person you want to be. You want to be the person at the gym. Let's put those clothes on, right? <laughs> That, right. And that is the first habit of getting to, and I'm the person, I won't go to the gym because I'm not a large group person, right? I can go to the Pilates studio, which is a small group um, thing. You got to know yourself. But the, the first step to becoming a person who exercises is getting the clothes on. And so I, I don't know how I learned it, but I finally did. It finally did make sense to me and I learned it and like that is like locked in now. Like I feel like I got to get up and put my exercise clothes on. I love that. What great tips too, because those are very, like, these are very simple strategies that are again, helping to create the mindset, the foundation of the change that you want to make, right. Or the activity you want to perform. And I mean, great tips, really, really great tips. So thank you for sharing those. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, I mean, you've shared so much. You've shared some of your amazing success stories you're seeing with your clients. You've shared your own transformation, your own journey. Um, any last words of wisdom, any final advice or something that you'd like to share as we, you know, start to wrap up here? I mean, I hate to, I hate to wrap up. It's been so nice to talk with you. (laughs) Yeah, it's very fun. Um, I think, If I had to give any advice, I would say, give yourself over to the process. That was the advice that I was given when I was struggling as a new mom. And I just really had a hard time with just the whole lifestyle change, staying home rather than being working full time and having this child that was crying and I was up in the middle of the night and it was uncomfortable. And that whole idea of getting getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and doing something different and just doing it anyway, Um, like that was really transformative advice for me a long time ago. And um, I think that when you're making a transition to this way of eating, like just giving yourself over to it and just doing it rather than, you know, stepping into it, like the clients that do the best, they just do it. They just, they're like, okay, I'm going to follow this. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to start. I'm not going to pretend that I have reasons to not do it. I'm just going to do it. And I just want to encourage you to do it. Give yourself over to the process and let us hold the hope for you. You know, I have a client who six weeks ago, her, her fasting blood sugar was 350. And today, um, and I get choked up when I, and I, when this happens today, it was 112. And I, and I'm not kidding, 112. And, you know, we're, and she has said, I don't think this is going to work for me. And I'm like, 
No, you just got to do this. Just do it, right? Just go through the process. We'll hold the hope for you. Just, you can do this. Incredible. Six weeks. Six weeks, you guys. Like, listen to this. Six weeks it took to go from a 350 to a 112 fasting glucose. Like, amazing. It is. It's amazing. Linda, you're amazing. Um, (laughs) If you're listening to this podcast and you feel inspired and you really want to talk to Linda and work with her, I don't blame you because (laughs) she's such a special person and, you know, she's an incredible member of our team. We're so grateful for your, you know, all of your wisdom and the things that you bring to the table. If you're interested in working with Linda or learning more about our amazing coaching team, um, please email us at team at masteringdiabetes.org because we're here to help you. We want to help you. We want, we want Linda to talk about your success story. You know, we want our coaches to come in here and coaches corner and talk about you, the listener being, getting these results. So please, please, please share, you know, contact us and and let us help you. Lauren, anything you'd like to share at the end of this, as we wrap up our, our chat, our chat with Linda today? Well, it's kind of overwhelming to tell you the truth. I mean, I, I mean, it's just, it's, it's an awesome story and the stories within the stories. There's just so much motivation behind what, um, the, the, the messages that Linda has shared, but it's also through the experiences of what she's got one-on-one bringing her experiences forward, um, using the program to help motivate other people. It's, it's just, I mean, it's overwhelming because it's just, it's so cool how it's not just about eating plants. It's not just about show up and eat salad. <laughs> there is so many layers to this, right? Um, I, I had someone the other day tell me I'm, I'm enjoying food again. I'm learning to like more foods again. And that was one of their greatest moments is just this, this thing that I was doing before I got here really didn't allow myself to like a range of foods. And here we have it. So for people that are listening to realize that um, this, this is, this is something where people show up and they don't know if they can do it. Like Linda just described, they don't know if this is the right place. They don't know if this is going to work for me and let us be the person to help you realize that you can, you can. And it's, it's, there's more to the story than that. So we'll pull it out. We'll pull it out. That's part of our job. Yeah, absolutely. And in the meantime, uh, Linda, your kale recipe sounds fabulous. I'm going to add that into my dinner tonight. I love that. It's so quick too, less than a minute. (laughs) It is. And then the dog follows me around the house as I'm carrying my bowl around and eating from it. And he is begging for kale. And so all day he wants to eat steamed kale too. (laughs) He loves it. But good for the dogs and the cats out yeah, there, maybe. That'll teach them to the bed. Cats. Yep. <laughs> yeah. He loves it. That's awesome. I love that. Oh my gosh, your dog's so cute too. Thank you for the, the tips, the suggestions. Um, have a wonderful afternoon. And thank you for being here, Linda, from the bottom of our hearts. We were so grateful to have you. And um, let's just keep thriving, everyone. Awesome. Okay. Have a great day. We'll see you next time.